Bueno, gracias, un placer, un honor eh, y, y honor a presentar a ustedes acá. I'm mixing up German and Spanish, which I often I said und instead of i. Um, so um, I, it's really a pleasure to be here. We're going to change gears a little bit. This is going to be a little bit of a biomedical heavy presentation, but uh, not going to be really too complicated. And so uh, I'm hoping that there can be some take home for, uh, for everyone in the room. So. Um, I uh, run the transgender uh, clinical program at UCSF. I've been doing this for 13 years. I've taken care of about uh, 2,500 transgender people, primary care and hormones uh, since 2006. And uh, what I want to talk to you today about is, is really getting into some, some details about prescribing hormones and talk a little bit about some controversies that come up around dosing and stylistic approaches. Often this is kind of like not really discussed it's kind of like here's a table with a bunch of doses you can take and the range is like from like this much to this much and like go figure it out. We're done, enjoy your conference. So um, we ran our big uh, health summit conference this past year and, and uh, got a lot of feedback that people want really nitty gritty. So we'll get into some of those details. Nothing to disclose, this entire world is off label for FDA in the United States and that's just something we throw in there but it doesn't even, not even relevant outside of the US. So. Um, when I have a patient who wants to start on hormone therapy, I am thinking from the very beginning about trying to tailor that to what they want. And, and it's important to remember that it is not identity based. So there are people who have binary gender identities, male or female, who, who maybe don't want to take hormones at all or want to take a low dose or want to take it for just a little bit and stop. And there are people who identify as non-binary who are seeking a physical medical transition. They want their body to undergo what is effectively a binary transition where they will have a binary outward kind of physical appearance, secondary sex characteristics, but, but they maybe want to take low dose hormones or, uh, after a while or they want, or, but, but, they, but they have a non-binary identity. And so identity and kind of goals are different. And so I am assessing at the first visit what are your goals? What are you hoping to achieve? And so I, I, you know, a lot of times patients don't even know what I mean when I ask these questions. And so I really try to operationalize it for them. I say, you know, tell me about what you want to change in your body. What, what, what kind of changes are you looking for? Sometimes I get really concrete and say, like, if you walk into a store and somebody walks up to you to help you, do you want that person to walk up to you and say, can I help you, sir? Can I help you, ma'am? Or do you want that person to walk up to you and, and if there's somebody who's not familiar with non-binary identities to just walk up to you and not necessarily know what pronoun to use? Um, and, I, and that really helps patients kind of understand what I'm getting at. Patients also sometimes want like a slow start. And this, is, this, this maybe is not even rooted in anything medical. Patients might just say, you know, I'm the kind of person that I, I'm very sensitive to things. I like to move slowly. I took some medication last year and it affected me kind of quickly. So somebody may say, you know, wherever I wind up, kind of, regardless of where I want to wind up, I want to start off slow. I want to go at a low dose and kind of dip my foot in the pool and then go from there. And then I talk about a usual start. So I don't talk about like, um, you know, the, the, like the standard. I talk about usual. I say, well, I have a dose that I put people on that's usually what I use for somebody who says, I ultimately want to get the maximum benefit from the hormones. Do you want something like that or do you want to maybe start at a lower dose and kind of creep along? And then we kind of engage in those conversations. And then there are also short and long-term considerations, you know, thinking about as the patient maybe wants to take testosterone for six months, get their voice to change a little bit, and then they're done. Uh, so I get, I get an idea of what's going on with that as well. So some of the short-term considerations in addition to that, there's a coming out process. You know, I'll have a 18-year-old trans guy who's sitting before me, who lives with his grandmother, who supports him and pays his, uh, like, a junior college tuition, and she is not supportive of his identity, and he wants to start testosterone tomorrow. In, in three months, at 18 years old, three months of usual start-dose testosterone, he's going to be basically perceived as male. And, and so, you know, I, have you talked to your grandmother about this? Like, what's going to happen? Are you going to get kicked out of your house? And so we just, you know, I'm not saying no, but I'm saying, hey, let's think this through. And then the flip side is there are people who say, I want to start on hormones, but I'm not ready to come out yet. So how can I dose my hormones in a way, and how can I 
kind of deal with my outward presentation. So for transgender women, that might mean that they maintain some facial hair, like intentionally to kind of hide the fact that they're taking hormones. Or a transgender man might go on a lower dose of hormones just to feel like they're getting started while they're still dealing with some coming out things and other things that they're not ready for. And then there's some other things that come up. You know, I had a patient the other day who has some pretty complex mental health issues that are somewhat entwi intertwined with their gender dysphoria. But um, we want to start them on an antidepressant, but then I'm also starting them on um, estradiol and spironolactone. And, and so we talked about what is it, you know, starting, anybody ever start an antidepressant in this room? You know, I, I actually haven't, but I know that like people have a range of experiences with these really powerful and important helpful medications. And, and it can be difficult if you're going to try to parse out like, well, was it the escitalopram that's making me feel sick or the estrogen? So again, I didn't say no, but I talked to the patient. I said, hey, let's think about this. I know you've been waiting to start hormones your whole life. You've also got some pretty significant mental health stuff going on that would benefit from this medication that you want to take. Should we you know, cascade this a little bit. Maybe we should start something and then in a month start something else so we have an idea of what's going on. And then there are pure medical conditions. Patient comes in with a hemoglobin A1C of 12. It's not a good time to start hormones. There aren't too many absolute contraindications to starting hormones, but it is something to, to think about and talk about with patients. And then so longer term, I ask about their long-term goals. And then, you know, when I do ask my patients, you know, tell me about what your goal is and where you want your body to be, I listen to what they say. And if they tell me something that I think may not be possible, we talk about that I can't dial a hormone. I don't have a panel with various knobs, scalp hair, facial hair, body hair, fat distribution. There's one master knob. And everybody is going to respond differently. There are tiny little micro things you can do, but you know, I can't make somebody who, you know, I can't guarantee that somebody is not going to lose their hair, but get all of the other virilizing effects. And so I talk to patients about having these realistic expectations. You'll notice, and Zill uh, Goldstein's going to talk later about informed consent, but this is all informed consent, right? Informed consent doesn't mean you walk in and get your hormones, right? Informed consent means this, in my view, in my opinion. Um, and so we talk about all of these uh, things. We talk about breast growth realities. If you are somebody who's post-pubertal, post, uh, transgender woman, you probably are not going to have a lot of breast development. It's just a reality. There's no cocktail of like this progesterone and then you stand on your head and there's, I hear, I hear it, I hear it all. And it just, it, most transgender women, if they are starting hormones after puberty into their late teens and 20s, if they're concerned about having breasts that are proportioned to their body, then breast augmentation is likely in their future uh, for them to consider. And so it's something that we talk about. And especially when you get to somebody who's in their 30s or 40s or approaching an age when most bodies are going through menopause, the responsiveness to sex hormones in breast tissue is really limited. And so I think it's important that we have, we, we kind of break these narratives that exist that there are certain magical cocktails that can make you get bigger breasts, there are always outlier cases and somebody's going to have a brisk response and then that person's going to tell everybody and then everybody's going to want to latch on to that. But this is the actual reality that we should really be kind of, you know, coming, working with in a non-shaming, non-stigmatizing kind of way, just really working to be like, hey, these are some realities and let's find some alternative workarounds and solutions. Um, okay, so, I mean, the, what do we do when we're looking for guidelines, right? I mean, I have three US-based guidelines up here and then the WPATH guidelines um, are, oh, this thing is a little wacky, are up in the corner there. So, you know, how do you even know what to look at? And I'm not going to get too much into the weeds because the rea I'm going to show you quickly just a kept excerpts from the Endocrine Society guidelines, which is a global organization actually, and WPATH is global. And, and from the UCSF guidelines, I'll show you that there's a lot of overlap between these two guidelines and most guidelines are going to wind up having generally the same thing because there's such a wide range. Um, so, the, you know, which guideline you pick of the major players is probably less important than how you kind of stylistically dive into actually dosing these things. So this is from the Endocrine Society. You'll see for estrogen, oral, it's 2 to 6 milligrams. For transdermal, it's 25 to 200 micrograms. And then for injections, it's, you know, 5 to 30 milligrams for valerate and 2 to 10 milligrams for cipionate. I mean, that's huge, right? 
I mean, that's like saying, you know, you can have between one and six beers a day, is okay, you know. Um, so, uh, and then Spiro, 100 to 300 milligrams, and then, you know, we have kind of the same thing, testosterone, 100 to 200 milligrams uh, every two weeks, or you can have that and do it weekly. And then the transdermal is a similar range. And then if you look at the UCSF guidelines, it's, it's pretty much the same uh, range, you know, plus or minus. I mean, there are some weeds there, but for the most part, it's the same. All this stuff is free online, open access. You can just Google these, these guidelines and get them. So, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time going through these tables because they're available online and there's, it's a cookbook type stuff, but I just wanted to show you that there's a lot of overlap. Okay, so look at this gobbledygook. Who, 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 who took like uh, any kind of chemistry or that, that where you had to deal with this, right? This is a lot of fun, right? So this is the hormone synthesis cascade, and I will try to use the pointer for this one here. Okay, so this is cholesterol, which is synthesized after just a couple of steps into progesterone. And then a bunch of magic happens. Each of these uh, bars is an enzyme in your body. And as you can see, there are a couple of different pathways that you can go to get to different things, and they're all kind of related, but ultimately you wind your way down to estradiol and testosterone and some of these other hormones. So each of these enzymes that's involved in, in certain step of the synthesis, it, you know, there's like eight different intermediates, and this is not happening in a row. Your body is an entire soup. All of this stuff is happening at the same time in one big soup and in equilibrium with one another. So everybody genetically has different variations in the fastness and slowness of each of these enzymes. It doesn't mean anything is like better or worse or safer or not, it just means different. And this is why for people who are familiar with contraception and cisgender women, some, a cisgender woman will say, I use this form of, of contraception and I feel great. And then they'll tell their friend, so their friend will say, well, my friend uses it and she feels great. And then another friend takes, oh my God, it was awful. I had mood swings, my periods got heavier. That's because genetically their enzymes are different and they're making different intermediates at different times. So because of that, because of this complexity of hormones, this is why we have this wide dosing range and there are so many different options. And this is why you can't talk about what you read on Reddit or what your friend was taking or whatever because I've got patients that are taking doses that are four times different in amount and they all have the same blood hormone levels because of this stuff. So it's important to remember that we're all totally different. So I'm not saying that we need to get, like there, there's in the kind of menopause world, there's like this like do salivary hormone levels every six hours and titrate custom blended creams and things. That's a little bit in the extreme. I'm not talking about getting, because there's actually not a great data to support those approaches, but, I, you know, but, but there's something in the middle where we do take this kind of holistic, whole body, individualized approach, both focusing on patient-centered goals and then remembering that everybody is kind of a little bit different. Okay, so let's talk about estrogen dosing specifically. And, and this really applies across... Uh, both transmasculine and feminine spectrum because I'm really going to focus on testosterone. In general, I'm going to make a generalization, human body characteristics are driven by the presence or absence of testosterone on a sex characteristics axis. Estrogen doesn't really matter. And we know that because people who have complete androgen and sensitivity syndrome, which are a range of genetic conditions where your body it does not have any ability to respond to testosterone. So there's plenty of testosterone in your body, but you have no testosterone receptor activity or, and, and related things. Those folks are born, they appear female. Uh, they're assigned female at birth. They have uh, female appearing outward uh, external genitalia. And it's not until they're not menstruating when they're like 15 years old, they get taken to the doctor. Somebody does some ultrasound or pelvic exam. They find out there's no uterus. They do a, a chromosome down analysis and the patient is found to be X, Y, and so, and so the point that I'm trying to make, and this is actually a study of testosterone and estradiol values in um, late adolescent and adult females with complete androgen insensitivity. So in, in this study, these folks had undergone puberty. They actually, they actually had like uh, developed like physical, like, like female puberty, like breast development and some pubic hair. And they found uh, that their um, testosterone, and, and you know, again, in the interest of time, and this pointer is not working great, but down here are the, uh, you know, I don't want to get into too much of it, but it's in the slides if you want to look at it. This basically is showing the 
kind of normal ranges, normal, for males and females who do not have any kind of uh, uh, intersex condition. And then this is the sample in this study, and you can see that basically their testosterone levels were in the low male range. They were, uh, their testosterone levels, I should say, were in the, um, in the male range, but their estradiol levels were like way low in the, in the male range. They were not in the female range. So you can ignore the testosterone level because it doesn't really matter because they didn't have receptors. But the point I'm trying to make is that they went through female puberty and their estradiol levels were like in the male range. And, that, and we know that. And so that's the take home point is that my approach to feminizing hormones is to get rid of the testosterone and then add back enough estrogen so that the patient doesn't have like hot flashes, so they don't develop osteoporosis, so they have some degree of libido. In, even if they've had vaginoplasty, you're not worried about atrophic vaginitis from, a, from low estrogen because they don't have a mucosa that responds to estrogen. So you definitely want to provide estrogen for a number of reasons, but the old approach of giving mega doses of estrogen, and this approach still persists in a lot of pockets where there's a perception that more is better, it doesn't do anything. If anything, it causes some weight gain, and that maybe causes some fat to kind of develop everywhere, but it can cause mood symptoms, it puts you at risk for venous thromboembolism, there's some questionable stuff that we have coming out of a study in San Francisco and two other studies that have been done looking at maybe there's a slight interaction in the context of PrEP with antiretrovirals and hormones we don't know yet, but uh, probably not a big deal, but still something to think about. And so, you know, my goal, and I talk to my patients about this, is yeah, we're going to get your estradiol level into the range of a menstruating female, and then we're going to block your testosterone as the primary goal. And if, you, um, if we have coexisting medical conditions that make estrogen concerning, like I have a patient right now, there's a BRCA, I have another patient with recurrent blood clots, we're going to focus on getting their testosterone level down. And we're going to maybe replace a little bit, we're going to maybe have an informed consent discussion of like block your testosterone, be able to transition and maybe be at risk of osteoporosis, but not be at risk of a fatal blood clot and informed consent and kind of plugging our way through that. So clinical endpoints, just a couple minutes here, we'll wrap up and have time for questions. Clinical endpoints. So for patients who are seeking a binary transition or maximal effects, in trans women, I target the testosterone in the female range, and then I add back in estrogen into the female range, arguably at the lowest tolerable dose. And for trans men, I target the testosterone in the male range, and I don't worry about the estrogen. It just doesn't, it just doesn't come into play. There are, now, now for like the 201 or 301 talk where trans men are having some pelvic symptoms and persistent bleeding that we can't figure out what's going on and other things, then we dive into what's going on with the estrogen. But for this 20 minute spiel, probably don't have time to get into it. Um, and then for non-binary people, I, you kind of have to make your best guess at first and then you monitor labs and show the results to the patient. And I don't do this just with non-binary patients, I do it with all my patients. Everybody sees, or if they want it, if they don't want to see it, then I don't show it to them. But I show them their labs and then we talk about what's going on in their body. And then I monitor for changing goals over time because I find especially with non-binary people, but really with all trans people, goals can change. And identities can change too. Though identity doesn't drive hormone therapy, Sometimes, you know, many of my patients don't have any access to mental health care, and I'm the mental health provider in the 13 minutes that I have to see them in their visit, and sometimes understanding shifts in identity can help me provoke discussion about shifts in hormone therapy goals. That really ideally would happen in discussion with like a mental health provider who can spend a lot more time exploring identity and goals with a patient, but that access is not always available. Lab monitoring and using labs to titrate. This is from the UCSF guidelines and it's something that you can access online as a resource. The take home point here is you can see that in the first year, I'm usually checking testosterone and estradiol at three and six months and then, you know, kind of at 12 months uh, and then yearly thereafter just, just to make sure nothing is shifted. Um, I do not check hormone levels more frequently than every two months unless there's something really unusual going on. Because hormone levels take a month or two to stabilize. Binding globulins change and things are very slow. Hormone dosing is not like driving a race car. It's like driving a battleship. You have to know you're going to want to turn like five miles in advance and then you start to turn and if you're turning too much, 
you've already kind of missed it and you overturn. So if you're checking hormones more than every couple of months, you're going to wind up micromanaging and overcorrecting. I don't, if somebody's hormone level goes from, let's say, just pull a number out of the air, 250 to 200, and they're both in the same, um, they're both in the same, like they're still in like the female range. I don't say like, oh, you went down by 50 points, but it's still in the female range. Now we need to go up. I don't chase numbers. We get them in the range. We see how the patient's feeling, how they're, you know, doing, and then we go from there. And so this is just more of the same that you can look up online. So this is the last slide. You know, where do I start? Take home point. So I usually start transgender women on two milligrams of oral estradiol or 100 to 200 micrograms of transdermal. And then I also um, use spiro 50 milligrams twice a day. And in any case, I get that plus spiro probably should have been deleted. I, I must have messed that up. And then I titrate accordingly. And then for trans men, I usually start between 50 and 60 milligrams a week. Um, I usually start at 60 because if you do 50, it's an even multiple into the one milliliter vials and they have a hard time getting that last drop out. So if you do it as 60 milligrams, it's 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 in a one milliliter vial. There's 1.1 left over to discard. So these are kind of like dispensing issues that come up. Um, and then the gel or a patch, and I titrate up uh, accordingly. And non-binary people, I kind of talk about goals and I and make some modifications herein. You'll notice I didn't put injected estrogen on there. I'm not a fan of injected estrogen. Uh, because of everything that I've told you about, there's no benefit to having mega levels of estrogen in the body. And the injected estrogens tend to bring levels that go high, and then they tend to vary a bit over the course of the um, over the course of the dosing interval, and it can cause a lot of mood swings and other symptoms. Injected estrogen is great for patients who have a high pill burden, who have adherence issues, or who tell you, "I'm going to go buy injections if you don't give them to me in a monitored way." But hopefully, we can move the needle through discussions like this on trying to get away from this focus on like the mega estrogen dosing. So I went about a minute over, I'm sorry, thank you, and then uh, we have time for questions.